Hey everybody, it's Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with chess.com. And um, we have the game of the day, obviously. It's the game between Carlson and Apomniachi from the Legend Tournament. And let's hop right in. Now it's a four game match, and this match ended up being tied at two, and they played an Armageddon game, which uh, Magnus was black, and he ended up winning the match. Um, this was game two of the match. Magnus was white in a Grunfeld. Uh, Jan likes to play the Grunfeld, so that's no big surprise. And Magnus actually plays a lot of different things against the Grunfeld, so uh, Jan doesn't really know what, what Magnus is going to do. And he chose an older line, which um, I used to play, and then it was just too much theory, so I stopped playing it. I like to play non-theoretical lines. Um, so they play this um, modern exchange variation, and you see this position a lot. And the way things have been going the last 15 or 20 years, white has been delaying knight f3 and playing bishop e3, queen d2, and then putting the rook on, on one of these squares, all of them, in fact, depending on his taste. Um, and in the instances where white does play an early f, knight f3, um, again, they're playing you know bishop e3 pretty early in modern games. Um, and Magnus played something that was very popular, uh, I would say, in the 1990s, uh, Rook B1, which is a move that I used to play. And the idea is pretty obvious. You're getting off of this diagonal. Okay. Now, the, the downside of this move is actually quite funny. Um, the downside, because I mean, the Rook's on this great file. It's not on this silly diagonal. I mean, it looks great. The downside is... In some variations, black can steal this A pawn, and that's what the Pomniachi decided to do since he likes to play the sharpest. Um, and so he traded and played queen A5 check. Now, of course, if white doesn't want to give up the A pawn, white can play queen D2 and go into this ending. Black can take, or black can play knight C6, defending his queen. The queens will be traded, and maybe white's a little bit better in that ending. But if your opponent's going to make a lot of queen moves to take an isolated pawn and give you the center and give you the development, that seems like a more testy way of playing. That's what Magnus did. Bishop d2, queen takes, castles. I think I've had white in this position twice, and I'm also pretty sure Magnus wasn't born yet. So I can't really tell you any of my knowledge because I don't have any anymore. But I did look at this line a lot in the 80s and 90s. Um, and this was really popular then. There were lots and lots of games in this line. Um, Svidler would have black. Ivantrik would have black. You know, the Grunfeld experts at the time. Okay, so bishop g4 I think is the most common move. There's still pressure on d4. So we might as well, you know, try to take the d4 pawn. Obviously the negative is this, this pawn can be attacked. And I remember I was playing a Fide Master in the, in the National Open and he pushed his pawn down my throat. He kept pushing his pawn. And I don't know, by about move 20, I thought I was losing. But his pawn never promoted. And I got my advantages in the center and e7 and stuff. So I won. But I, I wasn't very happy. I think the engine said I was okay. But I was actually pretty scared of this idea. Okay, but most of the super GMs play bishop g4. Bishop e3 defends the pawn, not only with the bishop, but with the queen. And this is obviously still their preparation. Knight c6. It's a real Grunfeld looking position. When somebody says the Grunfeld, this is quintessential Grunfeld for both sides. Uh, black has the queen side majority over here. Obviously two to zero. Usually it's two to one. And white has the monster center, the nice file for his rook. And because black has an extra pawn, black has had to waste some time with his queen so, you know, if the queen gets back to a normal position, if these pawns can get active, you know, black can be better. Okay, the white can take on b7. That's a fine move. But he decided to advance his center, d5. Um, I mean, knight a5 is virtually forced here. There's not really, I don't want to play knight d8 because that's terrible. It disconnects the rooks. The knight can't move. Obviously, I don't want to play knight b8. So knight a5 makes sense. Okay, and in this position, remember, you can never do any kind of skewer because the bishop on g7 is always on this diagonal. 
So there's not really any any problem in that that vein. Okay, Magnus played bishop to g5, attacking the e-pawn. Obviously, if white could take the e-pawn and push this d-pawn, that would be quite nice. And in this position, um, uh, Nepo played queen a3, which defends his pawn. And perhaps, if he gets a chance, he can play queen d6 and get his queen back to a normal position from you know, a2, which isn't very good. Okay, and basically, black is a pawn ahead. The queenside pass pawns aren't really dangerous yet. <clears throat> White has a beautiful center. Black's pieces are off sides. It's a very Grunfeld-type position. Rook e1, getting his rook to the e-file. His bishop can go to f1. He can play e5 later, maybe even rook e3. It's just a solid move. It doesn't really have any big threats. Okay, now in this position... Uh, I've seen a lot of Grunfelds, you know, I'm an old man, and I don't remember this move ever being played in any kind of Grunfeld, in any position. So this is a very unusual move. The engine wants to play b6. This defends the knight. The knight can go to b7 and go to greener pastures, and the, the rook isn't attacking the pawn ever, so it's a very solid move. And instead, Jan plays the most aggressive move, bishop c3, attacking the rook. I'm not a big fan of the bishop on c3. And because of the, uh, the, the, the placement of the pieces on the queen side, they actually get pinned a lot and attacked. So this is sort of a strange uh, configuration. Magnus played queen d3, pinning the bishop to the queen. Rook fc8 is a fine move. Excellent. Rook d1, good getting you know, away from the attack later, still a pin. And then finally b6, which he could have played earlier, h3. Now I've seen a lot of these lines in the Grunfeld with rook b1. And I must admit again, when black plays bishop g4, it's almost a certainty we're going to take this knight. And one of the reasons to take the knight is to attack the weak d pawn, which is not an issue now. And the other reason is, if I move my bishop somewhere else, then why did I play bishop g4? Obviously, h5 makes no sense. It's trapped. d7, I could have played bishop d7 and not let him play h3. So if I was black, I would take on f3 here. White has the two bishops. White has the better center. Black has the extra queen side points. But he played bishop d7. Not the move I would have played, but okay. Rook d to c1, putting pressure on the pin bishop. And this is the real... Mm, first mistake that Nepo makes this game. And I guess that's why they asked me to do game of the day. Because when I see a move as a mistake and it's black to move, you can guess what the move is without looking. And that move is F6. F6 is a very poor move and it costs Jan the game later. Um, black is about equal here and he should play bishop to B4. That breaks the pin. He's defending his E pawn again. So there's no bishop takes E7. The knight can always go to, you know, b7 if it wants to get back into the game. And black is okay here. Um, and the engine very slightly prefers white. No big deal. Instead, he played f6. This move is not good because not only are you weakening your king's position, but it's going to be almost impossible to save yourself if somehow you lose this pawn. Then the whole seventh rank is open. That's the one good thing about the pawn on f7 is your king is relatively safe. So f6 is a very poor move. Normally in the Grunfeld, we don't see moves like that because the bishop's on g7. So it would block the bishop. Well, but since he played bishop c3, he figured f6 was okay. I guess he's not a fan of mine. Okay, bishop d2, the bishop's obviously pinned. Now he's attacking it. Black only has one move to save his bishop. Bishop b2. You can't lose your queen. You can't lose your bishop. So, so he has to play bishop b2. Okay, they traded rooks, check, and queen a6. Uh, queen a6 threatens the a-pawn. Turnabout is fair play. If black can play queen a5 and queen a2, then white can play queen a6 and queen a7. It's only fair. And this is why this is the game of the day, because of what Magnus did now. After the move queen a2, the engine actually wants to play rook c7, a very passive move, defending a7. And then after bishop f4, white is just clearly better here. White's putting pressure on black's position. 
Black's pieces are all pinned and bad. White has you know, obviously a big advantage in the center. The engine, the engine likes white. Okay, he played queen a2, thinking the rook would move away. And by the way, if the rook does move away, that's, that's fine for white. Magnus played a brilliant sacrifice here. I guess Magnus watches my stream more than, than Jan does. Jan plays f6, and Magnus sacrifices the exchange. Rook takes b2. Excellent exchange sacrifice. The reason is, after the forced recapture, queen takes a7. The queen is just, it's too strong. There's too much damage. We can't move the bishop away. Queen takes e7 is crushing. We're going to play d6, d7. We're going to take on f6. We're going to play bishop h6 and mate him. We, we can't let him play queen takes e7. Now, I'm sure Jan saw the exchange sacrifice, and he had the following prepared. Queen check and queen a4. And he's defending his bishop. That's the only really way good to defend your bishop because if you played rook d8, queen c7 attacks the rook and the rook can't be defended and it can't defend the bishop. So Jan probably thought it was safe here, but Magnus did the old removing the guard. He said, oh, your queen's defending your bishop. Why don't you move your queen out of there? And he played the brilliant bishop d1. And I'm sure that Magnus saw that when he sacrificed the exchange. We can't keep our queen on our bishop because if queen b5, we have knight d4, the queen's going to move away from the bishop, and then white's going to be completely winning. Okay, so Jan takes the bishop, gives up his own bishop. We have a fork here, and black's king is way too exposed. Black's pieces are all on the queen's side, away from the king. The, the, king, ha the king has no chance. The White's king, conversely, is really safe. So the game concluded, queen c2 defending the rook. He was hoping Magnus would take the pawn, then queen c7 check trades queens. That's pretty nice. Okay, maybe Nepo was counting on that. And then, and then black's probably close to winning. It's an end game and black has a passed b pawn. But Magnus thwarted that, he checked. We can't play king g7 because we'll take with check. If we play king f8, then d6 is winning, bishop h6 is winning. So he played king h8, and now the brilliant d6. And the point of d6 isn't just to destroy black's king side, which it does. It stops queen c7 check, which is black's only defense. Black's trying to trade queens. Black's trying to defend his king side. But look where black's pieces are. Okay, and here, here comes Magnus with the bishop, with the pawn, with the queen. The knight's coming in, and black just can't defend. So a really nice exchange sacrifice. The game wrapped up pretty quickly. You have to take the d-pawn. Queen takes f6 check. Bishop h6, threatening checkmate. Queen c7. And one more accurate move from Magnus. The problem with knight g5, which looks good, the only threat is queen e6 check, which black can stop with queen d7 or rook e8. And then I'm not sure what white does. So Magnus, before he played knight g5, played queen e6 check. You can't play queen f7 because your rook wouldn't be protected. So you must play king h8, and after knight g5, there's no defense. I'm going to play knight f7 check winning. You can't stop knight f7 check winning. Okay, And the engine announces checkmate in six moves by black giving all of his pieces away with check. Sort of silly. Um, in fact, if I play knight f7 check now and you sack your queen, you're still going to get checkmated. Okay? And... In this position, he resigned. If he plays rook f8, I take it. If you make a random legal move, just so I can show you what the threat is, I play knight f7 check, knight d8 discovered check, blocking the rook. That's the key move. Obviously, other moves win, like knight takes pawn check, wins the rook, but this is giving mate. This is check, and then this is checkmate, because the rook is blocked. There's no defense to that knight f7 check, so instead of making another move, and getting mated in three or four moves, Napomniachi resigned. A brilliant game for Magnus, not because of the accuracy, not because of the sacrifices, but because he did all of that in a rapid game. That looked like White was playing slow chess and figured everything out by using a lot of time. That's not the case. This was game 15 minutes. So Magnus figured that all out pretty quickly. An amazing victory for Magnus, who ended up eventually winning the match in Armageddon. This is Grandmaster Feingold for chess.com with the game of the day. Click on this video for more games of the day, and I'll see you next time. Bye, everyone.